Now, let's go back to these slides and ask me questions if you need to before we move on to another topic. Hmm? So, yeah, can you go back to the loop and also the, yeah. So what would an example be of, you find out that your assumptions were wrong? Yeah. Can you give an example of sort of this chain and what made you like yes. start from the beginning with new assumptions? I'm going to give you a real, real world example. I have to translate terms in French. Do I have them in English? I'm going to try. We were studying the, the communists, right? So we were systematically studying different political parties, right? But not the parties themselves, also the public, right? So people who declare themselves communists in France. So a few of them are known. So we started with these known guys. And it turns out they they do not link to each other. So, and that's weird. But that also creates a huge issue because it means that if you have one communist, it doesn't give you more communists because they, they don't point to other communists. Or just a little bit. So at the beginning, we, we tried that and it didn't work. And why is that so? It's because communism in France at the time, and by at the time I mean... 10 years ago, um, to put it in simple terms, communists were kind of a flavor of altermondialism, right? Or broad left-wing activism, right? So they were not united because they were communists. This was not a, a label that created community. The actual community is uh, being left-wing somehow, altermondialist. So what you need to do in this situation is that you have to harvest the altermondialists and then you will find many communists. And then you can discard the rest to focus on the communists. But your process has to go to this upper level mm -hmm. because that's where the community exists. So the main reason why you will have to go back to your corpus is that the community you expected is not the one you expected. It might be bigger, it might be smaller, it might be... <laughs> there might be a, a discrepancy between what you expect and what you get. But then in that process, you already have a finding, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, of course, absolutely. Um, this notion of corpus is exactly the same as, uh, I don't know, your field when you do field work, right? You, you have to... It's a long... Pro I mean, every, anyone who is in a PhD knows that you can't just have... And you will, you will delineate your field while you're going to do your work, and that's what's expected of the process. So the, the delineation is the outcome, is one of the outcomes of the process. And here's exactly the case. So the concept of corpus has been imported from the social science. And what they have in common is that uh, the web is open, so it's too big. You can't address all the web, so you are forced to delineate something. And there are no good ways to do it. There are no natural ways. You have to take decisions, and these decisions always have part of arbitrary. But what's important is to be able to document that. So that's why Hive is providing ways to monitor that process so, so that you can document it, and so that you can explain what are your criteria in the end. It also means that there are kind of two different steps, stages in Hive that use exactly the same interface and the same features. But first you explore, so it means you're kind of searching what are the, not the good bounds, the good boundaries for your corpus. So you test your assumptions. And to test your assumptions, you have to kind of uh, be experimental, right? So you have to not focus on the quality, but more on variety. I don't know how to say that. So your corpus is kind of bad because you've tried different things. But then at some point you, you realize you have, a good, you have good criteria and then you probably need to restart from scratch. You know? So you will redo the same thing, but now you have stable criteria that you didn't have in the first place. So it's kind of common to restart entirely the, the same corpus just to have it clean. Mm -mm. Um, I have two questions. Yes. Um, 
One, I mean, here you're referring, for example, a lot to blogs and things like that. Yes. And I'm just wondering about sort of the populations that may have opinions and ideas and positioning that are, you know, that don't participate in blog, commenting on blogs and reading blogs and writing blogs and things like that. I mean, what are the other kinds of sites that you could, you could access that could give you a broader access? Because it's a very sort of specialized group of people. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering about how, what kind of conclusions you can make based on that kind of a, a body of, of sites. Yeah. Because, um, because a significant population is excluded from that. So I'm just yeah. So this, this, um, this is too big of a question to open okay. here. Uh, of course, it's a legit question. So there, it, it has multiple layers. So the web is not representing society. But also, the web nowadays is also Facebook, Twitter, and stuff right. that are not websites. So right. also, normal websites are not <coughs> representing the web. And you may argue that sometimes, uh, I don't know if you study something that is super high. Uh, let's, you, let's say you study OK Boomer, the expression on the web. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so will Hive help you? The answer is probably not. Yeah. Because this is a social media phenomenon. It happens in, in the news media, in the social media, in you know, these kind of spheres mm -hmm. for which Hive is not well uh, equipped. Okay. So s some, I mean, Hive is generic in the sense that it's not specific to any platform. So that's a chance to not stay stuck inside Twitter or Facebook or, you know, why do people study Twitter so much? Because it's easy. Right. Does it mean that Twitter is uh, where everything happens? No, mm -hmm. it's just easier. So, you know, the metaphor, the guy who has lost his key and he searches uh, under the light, it's at night. Why do, because he, he, can, he will never find them in the night. So he's not searching them there, but it doesn't mean that they are not there, right? right? right. So. The same happens here. So it also means that being generic doesn't mean it does everything either. It means that it's attuned to certain questions and not others. The kind of questions it works well uh, to investigate are when there are, un when there are communities. So when you expect a form of assortativity where you expect people to be linked on the same topic. So what I'm hearing you saying about this um, uh, categorization process, mm -hmm. this iterative process, um, not that I know so much about it, but it, for me it sounds a little bit like sort of supervised uh, machine learning, where you where you sort of you feed it categories, and then it finds categories. But I'm wondering whether there's an a, an aspect of Hype that also identifies categories on its own and identifies connections on its own. Uh. It, it's, it, it works such in a simple way that if you, if you see that as machine learning, then you see yourself as a robot. You see any kind of categorization work as machine learning, which is not completely unfair, mm -hmm. right? But what you're doing with Hive is basically manual. You could do everything manually. Yeah. You would just need to have to find the hyperlinks in the pages and write them down, right? right. right? And yeah. that's it. No, but my question is, does Hive also have an aspect to it where it can it can, it can begin to categorize on its own. Once no, it's not at all. Okay. Not that, and it doesn't, it, it proposes a um, website that you should take a look at, uh -huh. but it does that on, on, a, on the basis of just counting the number of citations. So it's so simple that you could do it manually. That's my, that was my point. Uh -huh. So in some ways, it helps you by something that you wouldn't do yourself but you wouldn't do it not because it's black boxed in something. It's just because it's too much information. Makes sense. Okay, great. But it's, yeah. So it's user centric in the sense of interpretability. You, you could explain in very simple words what happens in Hive. Got it. Right? Thanks. Nothing mysterious. I remember when we used it last year. Hmm? Of layers, levels, icons, oh yeah, specific so of, of course, um, mm, so someone is paying for the server. Mm -hmm. 
right? So the demo, for instance, is played by Science Po because that's where it's hosted. And it has a limited uh, hard disk drive space. It has a limited memory. And because of that, we limit the, the size of the corpora people can use because it costs money, right? So if you install that on your own computer, you can set it as you wish. And so in the demo, we limit the depth of crawl to one click, but yeah. you're not bound to that limit if you install it on your own computer. By installing it on your own computer, I mean that your, your computer will become both the server and the interface. Because your computer is always the interface, but it's not always the server. So it's not so easy, but it remains quite easy to install it on your computer. Um, the, it has benefits, of course. The drawback is that if you close your computer, it doesn't work anymore because your computer is shut off, right? While the server keeps working when, when you sleep and stuff like that. And uh, you can't collaborate on your computer because you can collaborate on the same corpus, working together on the same thing when it's online, right? So that's a good thing you can do.